Uh, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about uh, the 1990s. Uh, we're going to talk about JavaScript, and we're going to talk about style sheets. I hope I've covered that all on this slide. Uh, so yeah, my name is Steve. This is, uh, this is my, my, my Twitter. Uh, I currently work at SendGrid. Um, I work on a client for creating marketing emails, um, which is super cool. You build this big WYSIWYG interface with like React and all that kind of fun stuff. And then you uh, output stuff that would make Mike cringe. Because uh, you have to support Outlook 2007. And if you've ever thought, like, I remember dealing with Internet Explorer, that was bad. Like, Outlook is basically like, hold my beer. Because uh, it uses Microsoft Word's rendering engine. So that's a, that's a lot of fun. I know a lot about Outlook conditional tags. If that's something you want to, like, you've been like, searching yourself or someone to like, talk to about this, we can do that. And uh, as Jameson mentioned, I also run Dinosaur JS, another JSConf family conference. Um, so speaking of this conference, is really like amazing to me because the Web Rebels is one of the conferences that Dinosaur is kind of like based off of. It's one of its role models. So it's super exciting for me to be here because previously I was just stealing ideas without ever <laughs> being around for them. Uh, and I'm also working on a book. So we're going to talk about the year 1996. One of the best parts about doing a talk on the 90s is like every like keynote and PowerPoint transition you were told you can't use, you can use now. So get ready for that. Uh, but I do want to get us in the right like mental headspace for this so that we can kind of like remember what it was like. Uh, the modern phone at the time did not have a headphone jack. Uh, we walked around trying to collect digital pets. We spent time neglecting digital pets. We cloned a sheep. Uh, we cloned the beetles. Uh, we drank this. Um, at the time, I was, uh, I was 12, um, and I was working on a Mortal Kombat website where you can go and like, read about all the fun moves that you can do uh, to create violence that makes parents cringe. Um, and I don't, I don't have, I couldn't find the site on GeoCities, um, but I do remember that it was, it was loaded with animated GIFs for no particularly good reason. Uh, it was built with zero concern for accessibility. Uh, it took like three minutes to download all the assets, and um, it auto-played obnoxious media files. So effectively, it was a 2017 web page. Uh, this is very much what it looked like. Um, this is a Doom one, so if you just um, like reimagine all the Doom with Mortal Kombat, that's effectively what it was. Uh, and it was not uh, out, of, out of style for the time. There were other sites that kind of very similar. Um, yeah. Yes, Bobby. Yes, you do. And I see that you have an autoplay MIDI file. Good job. Um, and the markup was always, was always fun, because we use inline styles everywhere as HTML attributes. Um, and so you would put everything in there. If you needed to like, change another color, you'd go ahead and like, go to the sub element right, and do each one. And you're like, ha, 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 the marquee tag, that's very funny. <laughs> it still works in Chrome. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if, if nothing else from this talk, you learned that that's still a thing that you can do. You shouldn't do it, but you could. Um, and like, you know, I wrote the proposal for this talk before I started working at SendGrid. Uh, so just last week, I had to write this as markup for an HTML email. So I'm now like, I, like, I feel like I karmically did this to myself. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, you might, you might ask, uh, you know, a Mortal Kombat website, like, why, uh, why does the world need more than one Mortal Kombat website with these, with these fatalities and friendships in them? And that's, that's a really good question. Uh, one, I was 12, give me a break. Two, that's off topic, we're talking about JavaScript style sheets, try to focus. And three, just keep that in mind next time you're going to write a medium think piece about JavaScript fatigue. All right, so we hit about, uh, at one point I had finally visited the site 100 times. I know that because the hit counter went to 100 times. Uh, figured my mother was one of those, but the other 99 were likely me, uh, which meant it was time for a redesign. Um, and going through and um, changing all the styles on a page can only best be described with stock photography. <laughs> the only saving grace is that I did have uh, frames. 
Uh, so you like ideally like a frame was really cool. It's like this like completely like isolated um, like reusable piece of user interface. Um, we should try that these days. Also works in Chrome. Uh, so style sheets. Uh, style sheets uh, were actually present in the like original web browser, uh, as built by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. You might know him as web developer. Um, Viola was a browser that shipped, uh, which actually gave um, support for having custom styles. It was, every browser, you know, almost every browser, we'll get to that in a second, um, had support for an idea of style sheets, but there was no necessary like, syntax to write style sheets, right? But the concept of a style sheet has always been there, um, with one noticeable uh, omission. In fact, to this topic, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote, in fact, it's been a constant source of delight for me over the past year to, get continu to continually tell hordes, literally, of people who want you, strap yourself in, here it comes, control what their documents look like in ways that be trivial in text, word, or every other common text processing environment. He likes to tell them, sorry, you're screwed. Um, and the idea for a style sheet would be that like, the browser could have some impact on what a page would look like, but then the user could also provide a style sheet until someone came in with a reset CSS and blew it all away. Uh, this emoji, by the way, in case you're wondering, is called disappointed but relieved. That is like the official name of it. Uh, you can see Netscape had support for kind of styling pages based on user preference. Uh, Firefox still does today. Safari will let you actually like, upload an entire like, style sheet that would be like your user preferences for what the page should look like. Um, it wasn't until later that a third um, party wanted to get involved in what pages should look like. Uh, this was the author of the page itself. And this was to questionable effect. Uh, this is a page that I built in, I think, like 2005. So, you know, we let authors do it. That doesn't mean all of them had good taste. Uh, you can see some tables, lots of textures. I don't even know what's happening with that sidebar over there. Um, so, in order for that to happen, we have to have some kind of syntax for writing style sheets. Right? And there was a bunch of different like, ways of going about this. We're only going to talk about two of them. We'll talk about CSS and JavaScript style sheets. JavaScript style sheets weren't around long enough to get a logo, so I made one. Well, basically, I took a really bad JavaScript logo and then added style sheets and Comic Sans to the bottom. And it only felt right. This is not the official CSS logo, but this felt appropriate to pick the worst one that I could find. Uh, JavaScript style sheets are going to be the one we kind of focus on. Um, shipped in Netscape Navigator 4.0. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of uh, live coding. Cool. Let's go ahead and mirror some displays. I got a modern web browser over here. Um, it's just an HTML page. We can, we can take a look at it together. Uh, there's not a lot happening here. Um, nope. We can see that we've got uh, one, one thing to notice is that we pull in, it's a, it's a link to a style sheet, but it's style.js instead of style.css. Um, other fun things is we got an H1, we got some classes on it. Nothing, nothing really to see here, um, what you might normally expect uh, an HTML page. And this is what it looks like with no styling. Cool. Uh, so let's go ahead and let's try something out. All right, so this is a syntax for JavaScript style sheets. You can see we have the document, our good friend, uh, and it's got a tags property, and we have all of the different tags that are supported in the browser at that point. And then we've got the color property, which is exactly the same as the CSS color property. So let's go ahead and save that. And so we can see that it styles the page. Woo! All right. Um, cool. Uh, we can also change the font size and all the, all the normal stuff that you might expect. Go ahead and try that out. All right, the font size is now bigger. Um, we have some options there, though. We can actually just give it an integer. That will give us the same effect uh, as well. Um, in fact, document, because it's globally available, we can omit that. So this, this, this syntax is getting slightly, slightly smaller, slightly, slightly easier to work with as we go on. Um, we can also set variables, right? Because it's JavaScript. Uh, we can say, you know, the color is blue. Uh, we can go ahead and then use that multiple places. 
So we can set the, and you can see there's also ways of doing classes here, right? So we've got document our classes. We can go ahead and we have, this is a class in our HTML called first, um, which is not super semantic, but it's cool. Um, and we go ahead and get all the paragraph tags that are, have that class on it. Uh, the other option is you could go ahead and um, change this to any, and that will also get all the ones with that class, right? So some very similar ideas to CSS at this point. Um, let's try it out a little more. Um, we can try different things. We can pull them in there. We, can, we have IDs now as well. Grab something with the ID of main, and we can style that. Let's go take a look. You can see this page is getting better and better looking as time goes on. I'm really proud of it. Um, We can even use conditionals, because who doesn't like a little bit of indeterminism in how they style their web page? So here we will uh, get a random number between 0 and 1. We'll round it so that we either get 0, which happens to be falsy, or 1, which is definitely truthy. And if it is true, we will kind of turn the background color to black. As he refreshes it enough times to get it to work. Uh, other fun facts is you don't get errors in, the, in this version of Netscape, so if something doesn't work, uh, you're kind of out of luck. There it is. All right. Never know what you're going to get each time. Um, in fact, we can add a little bit of uh, user interactivity here where we can actually ask the user if they would like to be in dark mode or not. This was like dark mode was a thing in like 2005 for like three months, where people thought it based on the time, it'd be cool to like change it to different modes. I did that. Uh, we go ahead and refresh that. And you can see like, hey, enable dark mode. Uh, OK. And now I'm in dark mode, right? So we can actually like get a certain amount of interactivity from the user that you can't really do in CSS, which is kind of cool. Also, your style sheets can now throw alerts. What could be even better than that? Um, <laughs> in fact, luckily Mike taught us about the with tag, so we can go or the with keyword, so we can go ahead and use that to kind of shorten things. So we're starting to get something that looks a little bit like CSS at this point, right? We're starting to get the general feel of it. We we can kind of remove some of that boilerplate, uh, like Mike is like literally twitching right now. Uh, cool. Uh, there was also this contextual uh, function. And contextual basically gave us some amount of uh, getting a little bit more specific with selectors. So this will be, OK, um, find something that has both the class of second is a paragraph and has uh, also the class important, right? So this is a way to combine. We can do this in CSS now. Um, this is a way to combine multiple selectors in order to have more fun. Uh, cool. The really cool thing that we could have done is we can start to like we would have been able to polyfill things, right? Like we have the full power. We have loops. We have conditionals. We have functions. We can go ahead and be able to dynamically figure out like, okay, we want to create a view with a uh, viewport with um, primitive. We can do that with a function. We want to go ahead and like figure out how to vendor prefix things on the fly. We could do that as well because we have the full language. The other thing is kind of cool is we can also look at the window object. Right? Here we can take a look at this width. We can say, hey, if it's less than 600, we're actually going like, to pretend we have some amount of responsive design, uh, which is still kind of hard to implement. Let's go ahead and fix my, I tried to be a cheater, and some of that didn't work. All right, so here it is. Um, it is greater than 600 pixels, so it ends up being blue. And what's interesting is, as we shrink to less than 600 pixels, the style is reevaluated every time, right? So we could go ahead and, like, at this point, like, change the layout of the page. All right. There's more. Yay. There was a. We don't have screen. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I should pull the mic move of unplug it and plug it back in. Can't hurt, right?
Come on. Yay! And there was a lot of excitement around this idea of um, being able to programmatically uh, adjust our styles, right? I think a big thing with JSSS is that a value can change on the fly because JSSS is an extension of JavaScript. Thus, within JavaScript, you could change the color of font size and element based on some amount of user input. You can imagine like a form that if everything is invalid, you could change the way those styles are expressed based on what's going on there. You couldn't really do a lot of stuff because even in this version of Netscape 4.8, the, the methods to adjust the DOM weren't there yet. You couldn't query the DOM and like change nodes or anything along those lines. So a lot of the potential wasn't like fully met yet, but we can begin to imagine like knowing how we know the next 20 years going to go on the web, some of the stuff that we would have been able to do uh, with this technology. We're also going to do a little bit of fake coding. Um, there was a spec. Uh, not everything in the spec it got implemented. So there were a few things that, despite it like being like, hey, JavaScript style sheets do this, they didn't. So we'll talk about some of those. Uh, one of which was, could have been really cool is this thing of dynamic evaluation. And here's an example of that. You might be wondering, where is the function keyword? Uh, I don't know. I copied this from the spec. Uh, it didn't work with the function keyword. It didn't work without. Um, so we can only guess as to the uh, efficacy of this code. Um, and here we have a function that basically, depending on certain uh, other um, rules on this style, will go ahead and like, determine different things. And you can see that we can just call it as a function with this apply at the end. Uh, so you can have one rule that, based on the other properties of that style, would express itself differently. But don't worry, specificity was, was still a thing. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons for this is, and one of the reasons that if you were to sit down and start writing JavaScript style sheets right now, that you could go and just like, use all of your CSS knowledge, is because when it shipped in Netscape, it actually just shelled out to CSS. Uh, and so they, were, they kind of like had the same API. So CSS, um, the, I don't want to ruin how this story ends for you, but CSS kind of won. Um, CSS, which was kind of you know, pushed by Microsoft at the time, uh, was accepted as a standard by the W3C. Uh, JavaScript style sheets did not make it that far. So if you were writing a web page for Netscape, you could either write CSS or JavaScript style sheets. But if you wanted to write that same web page for Internet Explorer, you could only use CSS. So anyone want to take a lucky guess what most people decided to do? They wrote CSS. Um, and JavaScript style sheets were never fully accepted as a standard. And they, they lingered on through the rest of the Netscape 4.0 for, you know, series uh, and were removed by the time 6.0 shipped in 2000. And I think that there were a lot of uh, missed opportunities with some of the ideas in JavaScript style sheets. And it's, you, know, you can look at them and go like, well, there's all these things I can do with CSS now that you, know, you, you showed me. You know, there was nothing I saw in JavaScript style sheets that I could do back in 1996. But let's keep in mind that CSS couldn't do it then either, so that's not totally fair. Another thing that's not fair is for me to project what JavaScript style sheets would have been able to do in 2017 and across the 20 years that followed and just make up realities. So I'm going to do that. Uh, I think it would have been cool uh, with JavaScript style sheets you know, to be able to use stuff like Modernizer to see, like, OK, what does this browser support? And kind of implement the fallbacks right there. And like, OK, we don't support border radius. This is what we want to do in this case, uh, so, on and so on and so forth. Right? We would have had the ability to implement polyfills. Um, you can imagine stuff like asynchronously loading code would have theoretically been easier in 2017 if we could like, use async await to pull in additional styling. This is all made up. Um, even stuff like form validation, we could theoretically change the way the form looks based, you know, if we had all of our DOM querying methods and stuff along those lines. So a lot of these ideas, you're like, well, I can do a lot of those things with the tools I have today. Like, yeah, totally. And I think it's interesting to think about this in another way of, well, like, what, were, you know, what are the things we can even think of that we would have been able to do if we had a full uh, power of a programming language defining the way that we style our web applications?
And a lot of these ideas of, hey, functions and variables and conditionals have endured, right? We've seen them in, you know, kind of take other shapes. We've seen them in SAS and less. Uh, we've seen that CSS4 even has support for variables and custom properties. Um, but on the kind of SAS and less point, there is a little bit of a, a distinction, right? All of this happens at compile time, right? Which means if we had a function that generated a random color, it would totally be random when we built that CSS file, and that would be it, right? After that, it is like in the CSS file. We're like whatever, whatever SAS function or less function you have, it's still going to be in there. We have no ability to kind of have that, what we saw with the responsive design mode, where we could like take a look at the way the DOM was, the structure of our document right, right then and there, and make styling decisions based on it. And I would argue that one of the spiritual successors to JavaScript style sheets was something along the lines of jQuery, where we could take a look, we could have, all right, how many uh, columns are there? What is the size of the window right now? And make different decisions based on that. But, you know, Mike mentioned before um, the CSS object model, right? And Luckily, we got a slight introduction to it. Um, the CSS object model is basically an object representation of all the styles applied to the page. And here are some of the basic structure of it. You can open up your browser right now and type document.stylesheets, and you'll get this kind of array-like structure that's going to be all the style sheets loaded into the page. Um, each style sheet will have you know, a set of rules, and you can insert rules and delete rules, and you know, modify them, stuff along those lines. And so this almost seems like the kind of holy grail that we're looking for about being able to kind of get insight into our pages and modify it based on the structure of the HTML document. And in fact, you can do some cool stuff. You can dynamically, for instance, change the color of a page right, at runtime. Very cool. Uh, and this is what that code looks like. Uh, we can go in, we grab all the style sheets, we grab what we hope is the first style sheet is the one we want. Uh, we go grab its rules, we assume it's the first rule. Uh, we go grab its style, and we can kind of like go in there and like get that style. We can manipulate it and we can change it, but you can see that this is not particularly, like you could, a single change to that CSS file is going to literally break all my code, right? Uh, so here we're actually doing like form validation. Um, and in the DOM, we've got a lot of like, interesting ways to go about this. We can't actually, like, anything that doesn't make it into the CSS object model, we have no access to. Right? Anything that it doesn't understand gets lost and it just drops. Right? Uh, we have the ability to parse uh, DOM, but we don't have the ability to actually parse the document itself unless we bring in something like PostCSS as a client side library, and then we could theoretically grab the style sheet and parse and all that stuff. But we kind of rely on this otherwise. And the CSS object module, like I said, drops anything it doesn't understand, which is like me. Um, and like, it's hard to navigate, it's underspecified, uh, it's not, it doesn't give us everything that we want. Um, and it kind of represents a little bit of the struggle of building for the web. Uh, we've, all, we've taken this document viewer from the 90s, and what we've tried to do is turn it into the world's most widely distributed uh, application platform, right? And there have been some bumps along the way. Uh, and in JavaScript, like, we've kind of dealt with it as our craft has evolved, right? We've, we've started, what I, like, for me, a very similar thing, which is we start to work around the problem, um, then we kind of build better tools, and then we eventually like fix the problem. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that like you needed to know. I used to teach JavaScript for a living. It's interesting that like stuff like object that has own property is not a thing that you need as much as you used to, right? But like all of a sudden you'd be iterating up prototypes, and that was a bunch of fun. Also, it doesn't exist in Netscape Navigator 4.8. Um, and so there's all these things that we kind of worked around. We eventually like, came up with solutions for a lot of these, whether it's just catching these uh, before we commit them. We're using something like ESLint, making async a little more clearer with promises. Um, we theoretically have modules nowadays um, and stuff along those lines. Right? And so this is kind of, again, going to that process of doing things the platform was never meant to do working around the hard parts and just like kind of like a code of honor, like, oh, we don't use double equal sign for like, you know, all X, Y, and Z reason, just becomes the way we live our lives as like JavaScript developers. Uh, and then we try to automate those things, whether it be linting tools or build tools, and eventually we get around to like improving the platform. 
And we kind of have this new way of building applications these days where we start to break everything up into small components. These components are isolated. They, we can pass in everything that they need. Um, they can, like, we can give here is the state of the world to the application, and this is the UI that should be rendered as a result. Um, and one of the things, as we've been, you know, and this is like kind of, in a lot of ways, changed the way that we go about building these uh, websites, but it's had us butt heads with an old friend. Right, which brings to the, the kind of refrain that CSS is broken. And like, CSS has got some problems, right? All the styles in the global scope. Um, good luck figuring out if something actually uses that style. Uh, good luck to see if your code uses a style if you act, that's actually in your style sheet, right? It, a lot, there are some definite difficulties the way that we build user interfaces now and what CSS brings to the table. Um, but I am always, I'm always like skeptical of the CSS's broken thing. Uh, this is like a, a great little like thing by Nicole Sullivan, which it's like I've noticed that everyone who is very good at CSS doesn't seem to like fully share the it's broken uh, feeling that I think I initially felt. Um, and doing preparing for this talk and thinking a lot about the history of the platform, it started to make me consider uh, where where have I seen this pattern before. And I think we need to ask ourselves whether or not we are falling into the same trap. Because clearly, according to the internet, uh, not too long ago, you cannot build applications in JavaScript. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm not sure that I like fully, you know, just because we like, it hasn't been too long ago that JavaScript was the one where, let's just write Ruby and compile it down to JavaScript and everything will be great. Um, like, JavaScript is not dead. Applications, I'm told, have been built in it. Um, and even some of these have been revised uh, since then. And there were a lot of kind of, we, there were a lot of experiments along the way. Uh, and we were able to like, try out a bunch of ideas and take the best parts of those ideas and pull them into the language. So that's what I think that we should do. Um, and because we pulled them into the platform itself, uh, we're able to share those across the frameworks. It doesn't matter if you're an Angular developer, an Ember developer, or a React developer. Right? We've improved the platform. We've improved the language. We have APIs that didn't exist long ago. And we all get to kind of like, benefit from those rather than working on them in silos. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced that this, that we need to like throw out CSS to in order to be able to improve the web platform. Um, and you know, CSS it, it has its rough edges, like two words, clear fix. Um, but who amongst us doesn't? And there are a lot of cool things that CSS brings to the table, right? Uh, this is CSS Zen Garden, where people get this HTML page, and based on the CSS that they write, can dramatically change the way that the page looks and works. Um, and this idea of like the separation, like you wouldn't be able to do that with the same markup uh, if it was directly tied to every piece of that page. Um, at SunGrid, like I, there's like we still need style sheets, right? We have a Backbone Marionette app as our dashboard. Uh, we have a React app to build the marketing campaigns. Uh, we have a WordPress site for the main page itself, right? Uh, having a solution tied to a framework doesn't really work for us. Um, which brings us back to this idea of. I think a lot of the solutions that we have to building user interfaces and styling them right now are super interesting and really cool, right? But I, th I think about the process that we went through with JavaScript. Um, and I fear that what we'll end up with is a bunch of really awesome solutions that are each siloed, so that if you're building an Ember app, you need a different solution than if you're building a React app, uh, so on and so forth. And a lot of the problems with CSS, we currently can solve with build tools. Right? You have tools like in post-CSS like StyleLint, which will find all the things that you probably shouldn't be doing and alert you to them so that you can then disable the linter for that line and commit. Um, <laughs> We can make sure that we're not changing styles again, uh, like if we've already defined them and kind of catch those common mistakes. Uh, we can begin to like figure out, can we build custom class names for, so that they are scoped and we're not worrying about one class stepping over another class. In fact, in the platform itself, we are kind of moving towards solving some of these problems that ideally, once they're baked into the platform, we'll be able to share across every technology built on top of it. 
But I think one of the really cool things is this idea of compile time and runtime. And I think a lot about how we get from here to there, right? We've seen the JavaScript platform improve dramatically over the last few years. Um, I think a lot about like my, my kind of like pet theory and why that happens stuff like the extensible web manifesto, this idea that we provide low level APIs and we let developers um, be able to play with them like immediately, right? Async await gets into the TC39 spec and like there's a Babel plugin for it like two days later versus something like CSS Grid where you can wait a really long time or waiting for like Flexbox or anything along those lines. We'll talk about why there's a difference between those two in a second. Uh, and some of the main parts are explaining existing features and kind of giving access to them so that you have the ability to kind of have some introspection in there and being able to polyfill future features. And we kind of talked about library authors being able to like, there's an idea for a feature, let's try it out, let's fi figure out what the developer ergonomics are. And so we know that JavaScript goes through this process of being a straw man, kind of getting out of the community, having developers play with it, taking in feedback and eventually becoming part of the spec. How would we pull something like this off with CSS? Uh, there's actually some really cool projects around this. Uh, there's one project at W3C, W3C called Houdini. All right, and Houdini's basic uh, goal is right now, this is basically what we have access to. The dark blue, like we, can, we know that we can manipulate the DOM and we can have some introspection in there, right? We, have, so we've, we saw there's some amount, of, some amount of wiggle room with the CSS object model. The rest of it is completely opaque to us. We have no idea like, what's going on in there. And like, at runtime, we have no introspection to it. We can't see as like, application developers. So the goal of Houdini is to kind of give us those, those insights and kind of give us access to each part of the page rendering process. Um, and so for stuff like the, the CSS typed object model, right? that's an improvement on top of the object model where theoretically we would be able to do a lot of those things that right now we're almost able to do uh, and have a lot more insight into exactly how our applications are getting styled. Um, so JavaScript style sheets were short-lived. Um, there are some ideas from JavaScript style sheets that we've seen through SAS, through LESS, through post-CSS that have endured over the decades between then and now. Um, and I think as application developers, we're solving problems with the best tools that we have. Uh, but I think that there's definitely an exciting possibility to have better tools. And so what a lot of this comes down to is us. Uh, we like, need to be really excited about these ideas. We need to like, push for them, right? Because there can be experiments, there can be different um, approaches, but it's kind of like a chicken or the egg problem, right? Browsers are going to implement things that developers are excited about but developers kind of also need to get excited about things that could be coming down the pike, right? We need to get it kind of involved in the process. And yeah, our platform has limitations, um, but we've done a lot with it over the last few decades, and we've built like an amazing application platform. And I'm really excited about taking the tools that we have and figuring out how to take the next steps forward into building the tools that we want. Cool. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. I hope that the walk from the table here gets less awkward as I do this more. I'm like, what do I do with my hands? I think you'll eventually just own it more. Yeah. Like it'll become part of who you are. Maybe I'll just sit on the couch the you whole time. You could just sit and like awkwardly, especially now that I'm done. You could totally sit and just awkwardly. Like <laughs> maybe put your done. feet up and like yeah, yeah. <laughs> take a look. Yeah. Um, you mentioned dark mode and implementing that. Dark, I thought dark mode was like when you did HTML emails, you went into a dark mode personally. Uh, yeah, that's, like it's definitely, dark it's, place. it's more a sad mode. Yeah. Oh, a little bit of frustrated mode um, because even every version of Outlook doesn't use the same rendering engine. So you fix something in 2007, it breaks in 2013. Hmm. Darkness. Darkness. <laughs> um, so you, you kind of talked about the, the evolution of JavaScript and how the ecosystem has um, evolved a lot and helped us out as developers and suggested some ways that we could apply some of those same things to CSS. Is there anything that you look at in CSS and think, like, this works really well, how could we apply this stuff to JavaScript? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is looking at how the two platforms came at it, things from different angles, right? So you look at CSS and, like, the way we've always, like, processed it, right? And so, like, you do it at compile time, right? And you have no insight 
at runtime. JavaScript, you know, you load up the you load up the JavaScript file and you have all this introspection at runtime. And now we're saying like, hey, what if we run it, ran something through like prepack or Babel and like did all this stuff at compile time? And we kind of see yeah. like the answer might be both approaches are good. Let's use both of them. But they both started from different ends of the spectrum and I think are starting to. I know JavaScript is taking a lot more of the approach that I think a lot of CSS build tools took. And I think a thing I think would be really interesting if CSS began to take from the other side as yeah. well. So uh, that slide that you showed with the, the potential for, for more APIs into CSS, that stuff is a spec already, right? Uh, it is like actively being worked on, okay. right? Uh, so there's actually a GitHub repo for kind of all the work in progress and you kind of see there's, there's a few things there are like specs for um, you know, the CSS object model and this idea of like worklets where you can have like kind of like custom behavior. <laughs> worklets is the cutest name it for a technical really thing. Cute. It's I really like cute. That. Yeah. It sounds like I mean, an animal. Like, like who wouldn't want to work with a service worklet? A service worklet. Like it would be yeah, so cute. It's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess when can I email Mike about those? That's my real question. Like, I think we can do it right now. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> you <laughs> you, you kind of talked about you like delicately danced around the CSS mm -hmm. in JavaScript topic. Yeah. Um, I'd like to give you a chance to offend people by, te <laughs> by saying what you think about um, it more explicitly. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like on one hand, like I, I, the idea of um, Having CSS isolated components is something I've been like super interested in since I first heard about it like a few years ago. Um, there is a little bit where I think about it of the times we tried to like we're going to replace JavaScript with this, that, and the other thing, which is this is the, these are the tools that we have to work with right now. This is the uh, the best possible thing that we can do. But there's a little part of me that when I look at a lot of the syntax and a lot of the approaches, I'm like, the ideas are really great, but like. Is this, is this really the way that we want to live with the platform for the next 5, 10, 15 years? Like, is this, does this feel right? It's what we have to do to pull off this effect that we really want as we build our user inter interfaces. But it doesn't strike me as like, this is the, this is the API that I really want. This is, this is the way that building apps is going to make me permanently happy for the next few years. Sure, that makes sense. Um, how much research did you do on like the Internet Archive and a lot. <laughs> the Wayback Machine? There's, you know? there's one, and I, I, I lost the text font. I couldn't re-find it. Uh, but there was one person in 1995 or 96 who was incredibly excited about uh, both style sheet languages because they thought, soon I will be able to have print-like layouts and lay things out in a grid. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm hoping they weren't holding their breath. But <laughs> But now they can. Now they can. Now they can. <laughs> 20 years later, vindicated. They're a visionary. <laughs> yeah, ahead of their time. Um, that's awesome. Well, I, I, so you answered a better question. I was just wondering about like Bob's website type of stuff. Yeah, but. a lot of that. <laughs> like that. That was you know the the less practical research. Yeah. There there was the I'm really I'm I'm very caffeinated research, which is like Internet Archive reading all the discussion threads about CSS and JavaScript style sheets. Yeah. Uh, and then there is the the coffee has worn off. I'm very tired now. Yeah. Research, which was 90s memes. <laughs> um, and trying to find very small 800 by 600 pixel uh, screenshots of websites that I was too proud to blow up to make look any bigger. I feel like browsing like old school GeoCities is kind of like the YouTube loop of, yeah. of the 90s. Yeah. Like you just click web ring links mm -hmm. and you end up at Bob's webpage. Yeah. And yeah. Get a feel for who he was. I wish I could, like, I only found that screenshot. I wish I could, like, scroll down. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I had one wish, I like. I want to know more about Bob. He has a website. I don't think it. I don't think the story ends there. <laughs> right? I think there's more. Um, and I don't know if the other one. I think it was like uh, the the red one is somewhere. The first the first line before it goes down is like diviner of serpents or something like that. Like I I want to know more. Yeah. Like where, what what's next? Where That's does this where pitch. does this go? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your thank talk. You. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Please give a round of applause to cool. Steve. Thank you.